everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my talk is Estimating Security Risks Through Repository Mining. My name is uh, Tomasz Lengyel. I work at Intel. I maintain Zen and a bunch of tools that are built on top of Zen, and I usually spend my time fuzzing, pen testing, and secure architecture code review. Um, so in this project, I kind of am branching out from what I usually do. Um, briefly, of what uh, we'll look through in this presentation, we'll look at the motivation of why I am doing this, uh, what the problem statement is, and what we are planning uh, to test, what the experimental design and tools are, results, threats to validity, discussion summary, pretty standard stuff. So to begin, um, why do we want to estimate security risk? Um, I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with the XKCD comic. Um, Complexity is increasing. All of the uh, projects that we are looking at, especially in cloud scale, have a ton of open source components. And estimating and kind of figuring out which one of those components is going to be the next Log4j is super hard, um, even if you have an SBOM, right? Even if you have a list of all the components of your project, figuring out which one of those is going to be an issue, uh, have an issue, is, is really hard, and doing that manually doesn't scale. Um, as I said, we do secure architecture code review, and it's really hard even to just look through the first layer of dependencies for some of our projects, and then the dependencies of dependencies usually fall off the cliff. But um, to the rescue, there is this new project called OpenSSF Scorecard. Um, how many of you have heard of it? It's pretty new. All right, see a bunch of fans, that's awesome. Right? You get this nice little badge on your project, it gives you the score, 9.4, awesome, you're good. Uh, it even color codes it, so it's really, really awesome, easy to understand exactly what we needed, perfect. It does this magic by factoring in a bunch of data from repositories that kind of makes sense. Um, you know, do you have binary artifacts shipped with your repository, that's bad. Uh, do you have CI tests? Is the project well maintained? Are changes reviewed? How many different contributors your project has? It all makes sense, right? Um, not all of these factors are weighted uh, the same uh, into the final score, but you know all of these kind of make sense. Some might not uh, be as relevant, like for example, having the CII best practices badge on your repository, whether that actually contributes to security risk is questionable, but it's probably not weighted um, as significantly into it. So the problem statement is, does this actually work, right? Um, how would we actually uh, know that a project with a high score could actually be considered low risk? Um, there is pretty much no evidence, um, pro or contra, released with OpenSSF scorecard. So um, what can we actually do to try to figure out where we are? Um, Pretty much two things, if you just want to rely on OpenSSF scorecard by itself, is wait and see, right? Um, more projects will deploy it. Over time, we'll see if there is any correlation with, um, you know, vulnerabilities and CVs popping up. Um, but if you want to check, for example, just with the current set of uh, projects that have an OpenSSF score and existing CVEs, whether there is a correlation, that's not exactly good because a lot of projects don't actually care to use CVEs. So the ones that actually do have CVEs will probably uh, be correlated more with does this project have a bug bounty uh, versus whether it's actually low or high risk. So you could have this selection bias. Um, so we can't really rely on CVEs as a objective metric for testing this. So um, what else can we do, right? So if we can't measure it directly, we need to find a proxy. And if we just you know, rationally think about it, if a project is well maintained, it has code reviews, has static analysis and fuzzing, we would reasonably expect it to have fewer bugs. And we can measure bugs in um, repositories uh, using static analysis tools. Uh, we have been doing that for C, C++ for many years, right? So we have pretty good tools. And while bugs don't actually correlate with security risk, the factors that the OSSF scorecard considers should correlate with both if it actually works, right? So let's figure out how to actually do this uh, uh, 
test, and we will find the most popular C and C++ repositories on GitHub. We will run the scorecard on them, if not already uh, installed, and then we will run static analysis, we find a bunch of bugs, and then we will perform linear regression analysis to see if there is actually a correlation between those. So it's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, we built some tools to actually help automate this so we don't have to manually run this on our own uh, laptops or systems, and I've been a big fan of CI and GitHub Actions, so I figured, hey, let's just you know run this every month on GitHub Actions. It's not really designed for that, but hey, um, we can do this. Why not? Um, so we'll you know, uh, search uh, and run the analysis, collect the results, and publish the, everything on GitHub pages at the end. And the whole thing back to back runs on GitHub, and you just get the data set at the end. Um, I spend quite a lot of time uh, digging through GitHub uh, API for GitHub Actions. There is a lot of gotchas and a lot of limitations, and it's a pain in the neck. Uh, but it actually works now pretty well. It's uh, reasonably easy to extend the framework to pop in new checks. So if you have your own favorite static analysis tools or you want to do your own analysis, you can pop in your own checks here. Pretty much what we are running right now is the OSSF scorecard. And for static analysis, I'm using the Clang scan build uh, with the ZT verifier enabled on top that uh, helps reduce false positives that scan build could have. Um, I'm also running the Clang tidy cognitive complexity analysis and a bunch of other metadata collection like lines of code and all the different GitHub metrics that you can think of, like you know how many stars this repository has, forks. Etc. The whole thing is open source. You can go up on GitHub right now and fork it, run your own stuff. Um, some limitations on the data collections. It, right now, we are looking at only repositories with 400 plus stars. Uh, right, we wanted to actually only care about uh, reasonably, you know, well, mature uh, projects. So 400 is kind of a number out of a hat, but it works for us. Um, dependencies, that was actually a pretty big uh, roadblock uh, for static analysis. You actually have to be able to build these projects and how do you automatically build just a random project off GitHub? Like the hardest part is actually finding the dependencies for them. Um, so well, figured let's just grab for any apt or apt get line in the repository and anything that comes after that, we will just try to install it. The whole thing is in Docker, so who cares? So we will just try to install everything. It takes a while, but uh, hey, it's running on GitHub. I don't care if it takes three weeks. It will finish eventually. Um, well, we are having a six hour limit, but uh, it works pretty well. Um, and three build systems, Auto Tools, Mason, and CMake. Um, GitHub API rate limit is a bottleneck, right? So we are running all these scans in parallel, but um, GitHub is actually limiting per uh, token that you have uh, for GitHub accounts, 5,000 requests per hour, uh, which we can actually uh, hit with the scorecard quite easily. And also disk space is an issue, so if you have a project that just generates a round of uh, files, then uh, you might actually run out of disk space. So it not works uh, all the time, but it works pretty well. So as I said, it runs monthly. And um, out of like 4,000 repositories that uh, meet our criteria, we can actually automatically build 2,000. So it's actually not bad, right? Just considering that I'm just grabbing for a get install and installing all that comes after, being able to automatically build half of C, C++ repositories is actually impressively, you know, wasn't expecting that. And yeah, you can go up and grab all the data sets. Um, we get a summary there, you know, how many repositories we built, how many bugs we found, and how many, you know, complex functions there are. So let's look at, uh, you know, what we were set out to study. Uh, does OSSF scorecard works as a predictor for bugs? And yay, we actually find that for each increase in the OSSF scorecard, we actually see a reduction in bugs. Hey, this is fantastic, right? You have a point increase in the OSSF score and you have a reduction of seven, eight, nine bugs. Uh, again, each month you see a little variance in the data set, depending on when we actually timed out on uh, the GitHub API request. So you have a little bit of variance on what projects we were actually able to build in each month, but it's kind of consistent, right? So hey, awesome, ship it. Um, but if you actually look a little closer, um, <laughs> If you check this chart, do you actually see a pattern here at all, right? 
that red line at the bottom is actually our linear regression model, does not really seem to fit too well, right? So um, while the results were statistically significant, that's just really an artifact of the actual number of observations we have, uh, you actually have to look at this metric called R square to actually see how well your regression model is explaining the, the data you have. And what we see here is that it absolutely does not explain the data we have. Uh, the closer R square is to one, the more it fits the data. And well, we see that it does not fit the data at all. Uh, so yeah, practically no connection between bugs and the OSSF score uh, as is. So uh, that's, that's not good. That's not what we expected. Um, so let's look at uh, some of those submetrics, right? Let's just focus on the ones that we would, would absolutely want to see some correlation there. Like, is the project maintained? Well, we actually, uh, based on the data we have, we actually see an increase in bugs. So <laughs> more, you know, the better maintained a project is, we actually see two more bugs. Um, it's statistically significant. Absolutely does not explain the data at all, right? Those numbers are tiny, so don't take anything out of this. It's practically just noise, but it's still funny, right? Uh, but, you know, same thing for CI. Do you have a CI? You will see an increase in bugs versus what you would expect, but none of those results are actually statistically significant. So yeah, this is just does not make sense at all. Um, figured, well, maybe it's the uh, scan build is not a good static analysis tool, so let's take a look at some other stuff. So I tried it with Facebook Infer. Um, again, we see a uh, reduction of bugs with Facebook Infer, but it's not statistically significant and R squared is, is bad. I tried it with this other uh, more experimental cool tool called Binabs Inspector, which I'm pretty sure none of you guys have heard of. It's a Ghidra-based reverse engineering framework that runs Z3 on the disassembled binary, so it's not even source code based or compiler based. It's this crazy experimental tool, and yeah, none of it makes sense. It has a really high false positive bug detection rate, uh, so there is really no wonder that the data just is bad. So let's uh, look at it. some of those other metadata that we collected. Can we find anything that explains the bugs or correlates with bugs, right? Lines of code, that was you know, my go-to, like, all right, more code you have. Um, statistically significant, tiny increase in bugs, but it, do, it has a pretty bad R square, right? It does not explain why we have bugs, right? More, more code you have, you would expect to be a good explanation for, for the bugs, and it's not. Same for comments, well, uh, no surprise there. It's actually more statistically significant than lines of code, which, okay, sure. Um, size, again, statistically significant, bad R square. Um, R square is bad all around. If you thought that you can rely on uh, the social network of GitHub, is a project, you know, has more stars, more people are looking at it, is going to have fewer bugs because of that, yeah, don't rely on that. Uh, same for watches, you know, how many people are actually watching conversations on a project, no relations to bugs, it's not helping. Forks, issues, issues actually looks pretty good, right? Number of issues reported, increase of bugs 0 0.6, 0 0.46, so that looks pretty good, statistically significant result, but bad R square, it's not explaining all the bugs that we find. So, yeah, none of these make sense. Um, so what is going on here? Can we find anything that explains bugs? Interestingly, if we start looking at number of functions as a metric, we start to see uh, st uh, significant results with relatively decent R square, right? Closer it is to one, the, the better, but hey, 27% is not terrible compared to what we found so far. And same for number of cognitively complex functions. So cognitively complex functions pretty much just means like, is this function readable by a human? It's actually uh, defined, uh, there is a paper, you can uh, find it online that actually explains how the cognitively complex score is calculated. We have a threshold of, you know, for every bad coding practice, you get a, you know, a point. And if you reach 25, your function is considered 20, uh, cognitively complex. So we only count the ones that are over that threshold. And yeah, it's actually a pretty good estimate, right? For every 10 cognitively complex functions, you will get a bug. So hey, that, Kind of makes sense, statistically significant, and it's a good R square. Um, interestingly, though, percent of functions cognitively complex has a really good estimate, right? Each percent increase in the number of functions that you have in your code base that's cognitively complex will add a bug. 
that's pretty awesome find, right? But it has a bad R square on itself. So maybe uh, just doing a plain linear regression model is not, uh, not good here. Maybe if we do a multiple linear regression where we actually combine these variables into a single model, we might be able to find whether you know, these variables remain statistically significant and just throw out the variables that are not. So what we actually find is the percent of functions cognitively complex remains statistically significant. It goes down a little bit. Um, what we see is that for each percent, we get a 0 0.8 bug. And the R square is the best so far. Um, same for just you know number of functions plus number of cognitively complex functions. We see pretty good results so far. If we combine all, all three of those, everything remains statistically significant, and we see a 0 0.5 increase in bugs for every percent. So yeah, that, that percent of functions cognitively complex in your project seems to be a pretty good vector and easy to look for um, data point in, in any project to kind of see where you are at. If you look at uh, this model with the other uh, data that we gathered with Facebook Infer, for example, what we see is a reasonably OK R square, right? 0 0.11, 10% uh, of the variance is explained. Not really great, but it's at least not close to 0. Um, interestingly, number of functions no longer uh, statistically significant, so that is not a good uh, variable in this model, so that could be thrown out. So again, it's the complexity, the cognitive complexity seems to be the key here that explains uh, bugs found by Facebook Infer. Yeah, Binabs, all the data is crap, so don't rely on that. Um, now here is some fun. Uh, let's look at the charts of what we find here, you know, number of functions and bugs cross-referenced. Um, can you spot anything here that looks weird, right? Um, you know, that project there with what, like 60, over 60,000 functions and over a thousand of those are cognitively complex, like what are they smoking? Um, <laughs> here, you know, number of complex functions and uh, scan build bugs, we have some here with over 14,000 complex functions, like, all right, that must be a bug or that must be some special project. Um, <laughs> um, or, or the one here on the left and the top, right? Very few complex functions, a ton of bugs. All right. Now here's my favorite. On the right, 100% of the functions are cognitively complex. <laughs> that must be some underhanded C repository that people love and it just has a ton of stars, but it's all, you know, C macros and <laughs> fantastic. Um, anyway, the, the point here is that we have a ton of outliers in this data set, right? Um, so do we actually want to include that when we are trying to kind of figure out where we are? Um, interestingly, there is a statistical method to actually filter out outliers from your data set. It's called Cook's distance. And with that, we can actually identify 41 repositories out of those 2,000 repositories that have an outweighed effect on our, on, our, on our model. And if we actually take these, just these 41 repositories out, we actually see a 37, uh, 0 0.37 R square. So right, we, we jumped 10% in our explanation with the model for the data that we saw. So that's pretty good, right? So we have some outliers in the repositories that we scanned. It may be an artifact of just those repositories are what they are, or it might be a bug on our side or in the tools that we used, who knows, but we can kind of control that, filter those out, throw it away, and um, we still have statistically significant uh, results for all the variables we had. Interestingly now, percent of functions cognitively complex goes down to 0 0.27, so that means every four or five percent increase in complexity will add a bug to your project. So that's still pretty good correlation there. OSSF scorecard, even on the filtered data set, still has a good estimate, statistically significant results, but a terrible R square. So OSSF scorecard, even with the filtered data set, um, no bueno. So are just complex functions more buggy in general, right? At this point, that's reasonable questions to ask. And what we see is that it's actually only 
three, four percent of the functions that were cognitively complex had a bug, right? That's a relatively low number, right? Um, <clears throat> compared to non-complex functions, where we see less than one percent of non-complex function. But in terms of total number of bugs, what we see is that 44.7% of those bugs were found in cognitively complex functions. So that means that while only 11.8% of functions were cognitively complex out of the total, they had almost half the bugs that we found. And that's a pretty good indicator that if you want to you know, fix your repository, make it better, focus on cognitively complex functions first because you have fewer of them and they likely are the problematic part of your project. Um, so again, uh, we may have screwed up the analysis that <laughs> we did here. There are a bunch of limitations with the data set. Um, we again uh, used scan build, which is a very conservative static analysis tool. Uh, it's you know, it's pretty good, but it doesn't detect all the bugs, and it does have false positives. Uh, we might have had bugs in our data collection and analysis. Uh, we only build 2K repositories, and it's only C and C++. So whether that is, you know, what we find here is uh, applicable to other projects, um, who knows? Uh, and again, we only built repositories that actually had uh, dependencies available on Debian. So that might have been a, you have a question? The only that got me interested in cognitively <coughs> complex functions, can you please repeat the exact definition of it? The cognitively complex functions? Yeah. I suggest you look it up. Um, the definition of it is uh, involved. There is a bunch of factors into it, but if it boils down to is this function readable by a human? That's pretty much the, the gist of it. If a human were to try to read it and understand what that function is doing, will he have a good time? <laughs> that's, that's effectively the definition of cognitive and complex. Um, and then, you know, linear regression modeling might not have been the best tool here. Again, the data set we saw on those charts don't necessarily fall on a straight line, so maybe some other uh, modeling uh, would better fit it. I haven't found one that did, but it might be. So some discussion points, right? So what, where are we? Where, what, what can we gather from all of this? Like even if all the bugs we found were false positive, we didn't care about bugs. We didn't set out to really find bugs. Uh, we wanted to figure out how can we estimate risk. So if we have tools that find a ton of bugs, but are, they are all false positive, and they all seem to fall into functions that are also really hard to read by humans, uh, that just kind of means that we have code that is both hard to reason for machines and hard to reason for humans. Is that code going to be less risky or more risky? Um, make your own call. If we have our own model that predicts um, you know, a high bug count for a project and then we have the OpenSSF scorecard that says this is good, which one do you trust? Um, Seems complexity correlates with bugs, so why would security risk, however you define that, be different? Um, another discussion point, scan build is free. It's out there for a long time. It's very conservative. Why do we even have repositories where we find bugs with it, right? We should find zero bugs with scan build, yet we found a you know, ton of them. So I actually turned part of this project into a GitHub action. You can actually throw this on your project and it will actually run scan build on it. And you know you can just run this on every PR and not merge code that has bugs in it. And yeah, in the end, it's a pretty hard undertaking to actually correctly estimate security risk. Uh, and we absolutely do need automated tools uh, like the OpenSSF scorecard. But without data, um, how can we actually trust that those results are good, right? We get a low score with OpenSSF scorecard, definitely go and check out. You will probably find issues with those repositories. But if you get a high score, at this point, it's probably not a good idea to give those uh, projects a pass. So that's, that's not good. And I really would like to see, you know, when 
new security tools are coming out and making claims uh, of simplifying security for the masses to please show your data. Um, please back your claims with something that we can reasonably verify and um, not just guess. Um, if you think we made an error, uh, please publish your data. All are all up on GitHub, including the tools and the scripts. So please take a look at your own scans. Uh, I hope this is just a you know starting point for a discussion and just a uh, another point that can be added to the scorecard later. And please don't sue us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was my talk. Any questions? So you explained that you selected your data for repositories that already had 400 stars. Correct. Um, and I understand why you did that. There are good reasons for doing that. But I wonder if that kind of self-selected for projects where the variance within that set is very small. And then if you extended that to projects with 40 stars or 10 stars or whatever, then all of those other things that you found were not significantly, stati significantly significant in your set, you, you would see them having much more of an impact because then you're looking at repositories that we would expect to be less well maintained or have more variance. So did you <clears throat> did you look at any of those kinds of projects at all? Did you do any kind of sampling of? Yeah, um, the answer briefly is yes. That could absolutely have an effect on the data that we collected. It could have a selection bias on its own, right? The same way as the fact that we used only C and C++ projects and the ones that had dependencies available on Debian, all of those would factor into the threats to validity to the uh, findings we had. Um, we started with uh, projects that had a thousand stars, and then we slowly went down to 400. That sort of already takes three weeks to churn through. So if we wanted to have a cron job that kicks in every you know first day of the month and have a monthly scan, it was kind of the sweet spot of 400 repositories that actually finishes within a month. So that's kind of why we picked that number. Um, if you wanted to test it with 40 stars, just fork it change the number to 40 and see where you're at. Uh, it's doable. I haven't tested that uh, data set myself. Yeah, I mean, maybe the, rather than doing everything, you would do like a random sample of some of the other stuff to see if it does provide value. But thank you. So what is your... So what is your recommendation for scorecards like OpenSSF? Uh, one of the things that comes to mind is if projects enable certain like compiler options that engineer away classes of issues, one would be to check if you find less bugs. Like if, if you enable a particular Clang option that doesn't allow some attack primitives to exist or bugs to exist in the code, that should be a plus by default, I guess. The other thing is, should we ding people for using memory unsafe languages and then plus one them for using memory safe languages in projects? Is that is that another viable option? And of course, this is only for memory safety bugs, right? There are logical bugs that are hard to find, probably more easier to exploit as well. For that. Fantastic ideas. I have no answer, but I would love to see the data when you actually do that study and make a judgment call on, on what the recommendation would be. Um, could be, either way. Um, until we see the data, I, I can't make that judgment, right? And um, people like to say, you know, Rust is going to be the be-all solution for security. Uh, it's still very easy to have buggy Rust code. So just because you have Rust, on that, until you show me data that actually shows some correlation, I, I don't know how to make that call, right? So my question is, what do you consider as a bug? Like, are you considering only memory, memory safety issues? Are you considering logical bugs? And how do you, how do you define So the, the scan build list of bugs that it finds are uh, defined and are documented. The only uh, bug that we disabled specifically was uh, dead stores, right? When you actually move some value into a variable that will be discarded immediately after, that was the only bug that scan build also finds by default. We consider that to be noise, so we disabled that one, but all the other scan build bugs, you can go up on their documentation. It finds uh, buffer overflows, uh, unsafe you know, function calls, like string copy, basic things. So it's a very conservative. 
but these are typical memory safety issues, right? Like, in, when, yes. When, yes. When, you say, when you say, give me the data, I mean, when there is a particular thing that is going to protect a buffer overflow from happening at all, like the compiler is going to ensure that this won't happen, the data will show, right? I mean, we, we, can, we can run the numbers, and probably we, you can run the numbers on projects that have these compiler options enabled. We could that, see a comparison. Could, that could be an interesting vector to include in the OpenSSF scorecard, but again, um, we need some data on that as well to see which compiler option actually has a observable effect on, on the... So I think for, for you, it'll be, since you've run the data, right, it'll also be good for you to see, hey, look, we found this compiler option in this project. We find less bugs, right? And this is, this is how our data is. Because some people need, to need some signal on what is the right thing to do here. And yeah. there is a, there's a feedback loop, I think, that well, might come from you there. Uh, yes. So my recommendation is definitely use OpenSSF scorecard, install it on your repository. Again, over time, we will be able to see if we find a correlation with CVEs and OpenSSF scorecard scores. So definitely don't take away the message that don't use it. Um, if we wanted to measure it right now, we, we couldn't do that because that will take time to actually see whether there is a correlation. You have a question behind you? Uh, could you please uh, share that paper on the com uh, complex uh, functions? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, actually, if you Google for Clang tidy cognitive complexity, it, the first thing that comes up on Google will be linking to that paper as well. Um, it came from Synapsis, which is a static analysis company. They defined it originally and then Clang Tidy ported it. Um, we actually found the cognitive complexity scoring itself to have bugs sometimes when it uh, runs into some funky C macros. So again, everything has bugs. So. Thank you. Yes. Were they discarded for reasons of the tool chain or discarded for reasons of the repositories? Um, again, they were discarded because of um, this statistical analysis method called Cook's distance. So that actually takes into account the regression model itself and sees which of the observations had an outweigh uh, effect on uh, on the model. And it effectively removes these observations one by one and see how far uh, the model changes. And based on that, we can, we can remove it. So it wasn't manually picked. I didn't go through, you know, I don't know what these 41 repositories are. Uh, I relied on the statistical analysis itself to point out what are the outliers based on the model itself. So I have absolutely no idea what these projects actually are or whether they are. Uh, you know, bugs based on the static analysis tools or whether these are actually true observations. It could be that we actually have repositories that are as such. And if we remove it, then yeah, it, it negatively affects our model, right? So we, we actually see an improvement, which is actually not good. But based on the, you know, the charts that we manually looked at, it's probably reasonable to remove repositories that are 100% cognitively complex. I mean, we don't necessarily want to make conclusions based on some random repository that is probably, you know, underhanded C contest uh, uh, contestants, right? Um, that's not necessarily going to be applicable to something else. Again, I'm making a guess. I have no idea what these repositories are. When I hear 100% complexity, I think of every codec package I've ever read. Those <laughs> things are terrible, and every single device has a thousand of them. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, it's uh, two questions. So the first one is whether you consider at some point using maybe uh, data from OSS FAS, uh, which likely has less false positives than maybe uh, uh, static analysis. So OSS FAS is actually included in the scorecard as a metric. Okay. But the only part of OSS FAS is considered here is whether the project has a OSS FAS harness. Right. Whether the OSSF fuzz, uh, OSS fuzz harness is good or not, that is not factored into the scorecard. Um, and just because a project is in OSS fuzz does not mean it is going to be well fuzzed. It's going to be continuously fuzzed, but again, my day job, I do a lot of fuzzing, and it's actually really easy to find projects that are in OSS fuzz. 
and still find a lot of bugs in them by tweaking the fuzzing harness. So um, it factors that in OSS fuzz that could be included here probably would be like uh, code coverage would be interesting to include. So in better, you know, not just whether it's fuzzed, but how well it's fuzzed should be probably included in the score somehow. Right. And uh, I also wanted to know uh, whether you examined any of the bugs uh, close up or whether you found any interesting bugs from uh, uh, Scanbuild or any of the uh, other analyzers. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> didn't check them at all? Or, uh, nope. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. If you go up on the website, what uh, I, I checked is we have like a uh, list, a sorted list of the repositories based on the you know highest number of bugs. So you actually have you know the top hundred repositories with the most bugs uh, for each monthly scan. So you can actually have you know this kind of wall of shame. Um, if you see your company on the wall of shame for for bugs, remove it. <laughs> Any other questions? We have time. <laughs> All right, if no other questions, there is one more? No? Okay. No. Well, then uh, thanks. Check, check out the project and hope to uh, see more studies like this in the future. So, thanks.